Yes. Look at that. Lead engineer at data and intelligence at Truman Tech. Colin, there you are. You magically appeared on my screen. How you doing, dude? I'm very well. Thanks for having me today. How are you? I'm great, man. I'm very excited about your talk. I know you've got a lot to get into and I've been tasked with keeping us on time. So I'm just going to throw it over to you. And in a minute, when I come back, for those people that are being fun in the chat or just asking questions, I've got more books to give out. So beware that I'm going to be throwing books all over the place. Get ready. Colin, I'll hand it over to you. It's all yours, man. Thank you. Let's do it. Sure. Um, again, thanks everybody for joining uh, who's uh, listening in today. And a uh, big thanks to the folks at Big Eye for hosting this event and for uh, for having me in to talk today. Uh, the topic of uh, the next slot is going to be the unconventional path to data engineering. And the reason I'm here to talk about that, uh, other than the fact that I'm super excited about data engineering, uh, is that I had a really unconventional path to the role that I have today uh, and to get my start in data engineering. And so uh, if we could go to the next slide, please, I'll give a little bit of an overview of the topics we're going to cover today. I'm just going to give a quick introduction to my current role, uh, where I am today, uh, what my what my job entails, uh, and then I'll step back in time a little bit and start at the beginning of my journey in the data engineering world, um, kind of how I got there, why it's been called unconventional, uh, and uh, how that led to where I am today. Um, and then the second half of the talk, I'm going to go into some skills that I've found really useful uh, to add value to the organizations I've been a part of, um, especially since I didn't have the the traditional data engineering, computer science type of background that a lot of folks might have to get into this industry. Um, and uh, obviously, we're going to focus on those skills that aren't SQL, because I think everybody can imagine if you're looking to get into a career in data engineering, hopefully you've already started learning SQL. So we'll skip over that part and go right into uh, some of the skills that you may not have thought of in the first round of things that you planned on learning. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as the uh, wonderful MC mentioned, uh, I work at Trumid. Uh, Trumid is a fintech company. Our primary product that we offer to our customers is a trading platform for corporate bonds. Um, so our clients range from small hedge funds, family offices, uh, all the way up to big Wall Street banks, pretty much anybody up and down the, um, the stack of sizes of institutions that are involved in trading US corporate bonds. Um, my role there currently is lead engineer uh, for data and intelligence, which I began earlier this year. Uh, I was hired uh, almost two years ago now as a senior data engineer. I uh, joined the team when the data org at the company was relatively small, and we were really just starting to build out our tech stack uh, with things like our data ingestion, our data warehouse, our data visualization and reporting tools. Uh, and we've built on top of that stuff uh, over the past couple of years that I've been a part of it. Um, so as I mentioned, in my role right now, uh, I oversee most of our firm's business intelligence, as well as our machine learning efforts, uh, all the work that we're doing to get our machine learning models trained up and developed, as well as to get those into production, figure out ways to help the, the rest of the company with the intelligence that we're generating. Um, obviously, in that role, a huge part of the background is data engineering. Uh, if our data pipelines don't work well, uh, we can't train models. We can't use the data to make predictions. Um, on the BI side of my world, same thing applies. Uh, if the data pipelines aren't working, if the data is not of the highest quality, then um, we can't provide useful dashboards and reports and analytics for the rest of the company, uh, as well as for our external stakeholders who uh, rely on us for the reports we have. Um, and in this role now, um, when I joined, I was completely an IC. Uh, individual contributor, spent almost all my time designing software and coding and designing data pipelines, um, shipping SQL pipelines. Um, and then in my current role, I would say my, depends on the week, but my job splits about 80-20 between management responsibilities and IC. Um, I haven't completely left the world of pr writing production code, uh, trying not to let those skills atrophy too much uh, as I move more along spend more of my time in management, but still get to uh, to merge a few PRs every week, which I really enjoy. Um, next slide, please. 
So like I said, I, I want to go back to when I started in data engineering and talk a little bit about how my path led to this, uh, this business and this industry, and hopefully give some pointers to uh, folks who are listening in today who, who may not have the traditional background of a math degree or an engineering degree or a computer science degree, uh, but still have, have caught the bug and want to get involved in, in this business. Um, some ways that, that you might differentiate yourself from other folks who are applying for these roles or find ways to make yourself valuable uh, in the companies and the organizations that you're working in. Um, so my story starts um, about eight or nine years ago now. I, I joined Uber uh, and I was not really um, involved in the data organization when I joined. Uh, at best, I was a customer of the data team. I joined a team called Driver Operations. I spent about 18 months there. Um, as the name implies, I was mostly involved in the driver side of the business, uh, recruiting drivers, getting them onboarded, and trying to help manage the supply of the drivers for the cities that I was uh, in charge of. Uh, as I got more involved in that role, and as the company grew, uh, the responsibilities of that role became heavily analytical. Um, it wasn't just hustling and holding events to recruit drivers and passing out promo cards anymore. Uh, it became much more about understanding things at scale, understanding the locations of drivers at certain times. Uh, where did we have supply and demand mismatches? Um, also looking at our onboarding pipelines that we were in charge of and seeing how those things were progressing and understanding where people might be getting stuck in the funnel, uh, what parts were taking too long so that people were dropping out. Uh, and that's when I started to get really involved uh, with the data team and the data organization. Um, and so I guess my first involvement and my biggest involvement that led to my role now is I started to point out data reliability and data issue, data quality issues that were making it uh, more complicated to do my job at the time. Um, and through that, I became, I developed some relationships with the folks who were in charge of fixing those data reliability problems and providing the next round of analytical solutions for us. And that led to my next role, um, which was on the team called Product Operations. And in that job, I moved a little bit closer to the data team. I still wasn't checking in code, still wasn't responsible for any of the tech stack or technical aspects of it. Um, but in the Product Ops role, I really spent time as a kind of connective tissue between product and engineering and then the operations side of the business. Um, so I think if you listen to the last talk, uh, this will make a lot of sense to you is that in many organizations, there's a lot of communication mismatches between the people who are using the data and the people who are stewards of the data, who are responsible for producing it and for maintaining the uh, data pipelines and data models and analytical products of the business. And so my job was to try to bridge that gap and become a translator. Um, I spent about nine months doing that. Uh, and finally, during that time, I had learned enough about SQL and learned to code well enough and realized that where I really wanted to spend my time and where I really could add value was if I started to work on the data pipelines and the data quality issues themselves. And so I started my first data engineering role a total of a little over two years after I started at the company and spent various uh, roles being a customer or adjacent to the data team. I uh, did that at Uber for about three more years. And, um, you know, shout out to all the good folks at Big Eye who are also veterans of the Uber data team. Um, worked on a few different teams there from the core data modeling team uh, to some teams focused on A-B testing and experimentation and a few other topics as well. Uh, and when I left that company, I worked for a couple of years at, uh, on the data science and data engineering side of a venture fund in San Francisco. Um, that lasted me about two years, uh, and in 2021, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is where I landed in my current role. Next slide, please. Uh, so, as I mentioned, um, I want to jump into some skills that uh, I found were, uh, I guess, lacking in my skill set when I started to try to get into the data engineering space, and things that I found useful to really ramp up on, uh, and hopefully, uh, if you're looking to jump into your career as a data engineer or just to level up your skills uh, and get more, but make yourself more valuable to the organizations you're a part of, uh, you could find a lot of these things useful as well. Um, they weren't obvious to me uh, when I first looked in from the outside and said, I think I want to do that job. 
Um, so hopefully by uh, highlighting these, I can uh, give you some cheat codes and shortcuts to uh, make yourself a better candidate for whatever job you want to apply to next. Uh, the first thing I remember on my first day when they said, you can join the team as a data engineer, uh, one of the first things I was asked to do was clone our team's code repositories and get into that. And the world of Git and version control was completely foreign to me at the time. Uh, that had never been something that had come up uh, in any of the previous jobs I'd had. Uh, and so that was something that I found myself quickly trying to, to ramp up on and level up on so that I could keep contributing. Uh, and so that I could make sure that when I finished something and when I had code that I wanted to contribute that I felt was valuable, uh, that I wasn't blocked by just not knowing how to operate the repos and stuff like that. So when you start to look at these kinds of roles, uh, learn things like what is a commit? What is a pull request? What is the difference between merge and rebase? Um, and then these things are really important if you learn how to interact with the UI um, the for the providers of these types of products, primarily GitHub and GitLab in the majority of the organizations you're going to work in, uh, and learn how to interact with them from the command line as well. And what are the relationships between those couple of things? Uh, this will hopefully help accelerate what you need to do and make sure that when you've got your fix ready for the data quality issue you've identified, that you're able to get it into production and get it reviewed as quickly as you can. I uh, also found myself really quickly needing to learn a lot of scripting tasks. Uh, this is going to be mostly done in Python in almost any organization. Uh, it's kind of the, the language of our, our industry these days, and I think will be for, for a good while. Um, you don't have to understand how to write an entire backend service. Uh, you don't have to, have to become a software engineer to be a good data engineer. But knowing a good bit of scripting and a few uh, important libraries that are often used in data will really help you accelerate what you're trying to do. Uh, some good examples are CSV as part of the Python standard libraries. Um, if you can very quickly and efficiently know how to get data into and out of uh, things that are on your local file system or files that are stored in remote locations, that's going to help you a ton. Uh, Pandas is another good one. Uh, once you learn SQL, Pandas is kind of the uh, Python answer to managing data using SQL queries. Has a lot of the same concepts. Uh, and if you can do things in Pandas uh, as well as you can do them in SQL, you'll be on a, in a, on a great path to uh, getting yourself moving towards a higher level of skill. Um, another library I recommend you check out is Requests. Um, again, you don't have to be a software engineer to be a good data engineer, but knowing how to uh, connect to uh, REST APIs and pull down basic data that you might interact with from vendors that your organization uses or from internal APIs that your company develops, uh, it'll help you a whole lot. Uh, Matplotlib is another one great for data visualization uh, when you're starting to do data analyses and look at the stuff that your team is producing. Uh, and Beautiful Soup is another one I mentioned, uh, not necessarily relevant for every role, but tons of jobs uh, will have some kind of element of web scraping or web page scraping. Uh, Beautiful Soup is a great library that you can use to parse HTML pages into Python uh, so that you can start to treat those uh, and extract data from web pages in a way that's a lot better than copy and pasting. Uh, last thing I'll mention in this group is orchestration tools. Um, you know, you, you're going to spend a lot of time learning SQL um, to become a data engineer. The way that that SQL is going to get into production in almost any organization you join is going to be through a tool that manages them through a DAC, uh, directed acyclic graph. Um, the most common one is Airflow. There are some competitors to Airflow that have been coming up in the past couple of years, like Prefect and Dagster. Um, these are just tools that are available to, uh, to most companies that help you string tasks together. Um, maybe it's running a number of SQL files uh, in a particular sequence uh, with certain dependencies, or maybe you need to extract data from a file system, um, put it into a database, and then run SQL ETLs over it. Uh, these types of tools help you string these things together and automate them and schedule them. Uh, and you'll find that almost any data engineering job, they'll be a huge part of your role. Uh, I also put dbt on here as it's uh, a tool that we use in my current job and that I'm sure a ton of people on this uh, on this conference have become used to using in the past few years. Uh, it's come up really quickly as a, um, a tool that folks use for orchestrating SQL pipelines. 
So it would really be good for you to uh, brush up your skills and understand how that works. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Another set of hard skills. These are not really technology skills, but these are skills that will really help you um, interact with other folks at the company, understand the data that you're looking at, um, and become much more fluent in the language that folks around the company are speaking when you're in conversations about data. Um, knowing some basics about statistics. Uh, people will talk all the time about the distributions of the data sets that you're looking at. Uh, this is a huge tool that we use in measuring data reliability. Uh, we know what the distribution of columns in our database should be. Uh, and if what we see in the data doesn't match that distribution, that's a really good sign that we might have a data reliability problem that we need to look into, or that the business context uh, that led to all of our assumptions about the data has changed. Uh, same thing with correlations. Um, that's one thing that we use a lot, and I'm sure a lot of other folks use as well, is we assume uh, that correlations between different parts of our data should remain pretty constant over time. And if those correlations start to change, that's a good indication that that's something we need to look at. Uh, that's really going to help you if you understand those kinds of concepts. Uh, things like discrete metrics versus continuous. Uh, that's another big one. This will help you understand which data types you might need to use or how certain things are structured within your team's data. And uh, combinatorics is another part of statistics that has helped me a ton in just understanding uh, when you have different data sets that may need to be joined together or may be combined in certain ways, kind of helping you to estimate the magnitude of what you're looking at, how big that data set is going to be, uh, what types of cardinality you might see in different columns. These are all things that are going to make you um, a much more uh, fluent in the way that you need to talk about the data and describe it to other folks within a tech organization. Um, also, it'd be good if you understood just the basics of the finance and accounting. I mean, our role as data teams, um, a huge part of our role is to help the business uh, measure itself and help provide benchmarks and reporting. Um, if the folks who are talking about measuring the business are speaking a language you don't understand, uh, it's gonna be really hard for you to be a big contributor to those conversations. Somebody comes to you and says, I think we have a data reliability problem. The gross margin looks wrong in today's report. Uh, if you don't know that the gross margin of your business is its revenue minus its costs, then that's going to be really hard for you to resolve that problem. Um, and so understanding what those concepts are, what the term means, and then how that maps to the data that you're spending your time looking at, uh, that's going to be a huge help to you just to be able to have conversations with other parts of the business who are going to be your customers as a data engineer. And finally, speaking of uh, other parts of the business, I've mentioned a few times, you know, it's not necessary to learn all the same skills as a software engineer to be an effective data engineer, but just knowing a bit about what their jobs look like and what different parts of your organization's tech stack are responsible for uh, is going to be really helpful in your job as well, because those are the people who are producing the data that you're going to be responsible for maintaining and analyzing. And so if you understand this particular set of data uh, at my organization is produced by the front end or by the mobile app, while these other data sets that I know about, these are produced by backend services. Uh, then when something comes up that you need to ask questions about the data or resolve a bug or look at an issue about missing data or incorrect data, you know exactly where that comes from and whom you can ask to make sure that gets resolved. Next slide, please. Um, also want to go into some soft skills, you know, non-technical skills that uh, I have found really valuable uh, and that I have um, noticed are really valuable in other folks who spend time in this role. Um, and this was a big part of the previous talk uh, as well about org structure and roles and responsibilities at the company. Um, a huge part of our job as data engineers is that we sit in between many different parts of the company and kind of serve as a connective layer between the tech organization, the business, the product team, the finance org, things like that. Um, so spend some time uh, in whatever organization you find yourself uh, understanding who does what, who's responsible for what types of decisions, uh, so that when something comes up and you might say, we need to make a big change to this particular data set so that we can more effectively use it for reporting, uh, is it the product manager that's gonna finally make that call? Is it an engineering manager? Is it a back-end developer? Uh, if you know that in advance, 
you can spend a lot less time going and pinging yourself around different parts of the company trying to find the right person. Uh, unfortunately, you might spend some time getting told, that's not my job. I would do that. I agree with you, but I can't make that decision. Uh, if you invest some time in understanding who can make that decision, when it comes time for you to find that person, you'll already know who it is. And you can make yourself a lot more useful by just accelerating the time to value for those types of decisions. Um, another related point that I would make, and I really want to emphasize this one, is having empathy for all the folks that you work with at the company. Um, you know, as I mentioned, as data engineers, we sit between software engineers and the business side a lot of the times. Uh, and those folks are often in conflict with each other about what they want out of the data or what they want to do to manage the data. I uh, really would encourage everyone to resist taking sides in those conversations uh, because it's really not going to uh, ultimately be to your advantage to always find yourself arguing the same side of those conversations. Because in one conversation, you may really need the support of software engineers at your organization uh, to be able to get done what you need to make the data of the highest quality and of the most value you can. The next time you're in that meeting, you'll have everything you need from the software engineers and you're gonna need a favor from the business side to make sure that you get things done the way you need to. Um, so making sure that you invest the time to understand what each person does how they contribute to the organization, and why certain parts of their job work the way they do. Uh, that's going to demonstrate to those folks that you're a team player, uh, that you're trying to help all of them out. And so when they need, uh, when it comes time for them to help you out, they're going to be much more willing to do so. And that's going to make you more effective overall. And finally, the thing I would uh, mention at the end is spend some time uh, leveling up your skills and making presentations, public speaking. Um, at a certain point in your career, you'll probably be asked to talk about what your team has done. Uh, and if you can spend hours or months or years working on something at the company and you don't have the skills to tell everybody what you did, um, then that's not going to be nearly as effective and that's not going to have nearly the same impact uh, that you would have if you could spend that 20 minutes or 30 minutes uh, making a really tight and really good presentation about what you've accomplished. It's gonna help a lot of people to understand the value of your team, and it's gonna make a lot more people excited about continuing to invest in data and the organization you've spent so, so much time and put in so much work to do. Um, next slide, please. So I'll wrap up here um, just with a quick plug for some of the career paths that we might have available for you at Truman if you're in, interested. Um, you can check out the website here at truman.com slash careers. Uh, we're actively recruiting right now, trying to fill some roles for our summer internship positions. Uh, we also have some openings for software engineers and for quantitative researchers. Uh, the highest priority stuff we need now, um, fully recognizing I'm at a data engineering conference, but if there are any software engineers lurking in the crowd, uh, we would love to hear from you as well. Um, we've built a bunch of really cool products and we need to hire some more engineers uh, to scale up to the next phase of our company's growth. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you uh, if you're interested in the fintech space or securities trading or bonds, uh, it would be great to have a chat. And if you go to the next slide, please, uh, this is how you can get in touch with me. Uh, if you wanna chat about any of those things or any other topic that I've brought up today, uh, my email is cread, C-R-E-I-D at trumantech.com. I'm happy to chat with anybody on LinkedIn as well. Uh, please just um, send me a DM on there. I would love to hear from you. Um, next slide, please. I think that's the end of my talk for today. Awesome. Colin, thank you so much, man. There were so many good questions and comments coming through in the chat. I'm going to leave a moment in case anyone wants to ask them. There was one that already got thrown through and I'll start with that. But before I do that, I want to mention that this talk just fits. It just clicks with the last talk from Susan and good old AJ would have loved to have found this information back from that talk. So now the question is, do you get imposter syndrome still? Uh, that's a great question. And um, I wish I could tell you the answer is no, but I absolutely do. Um, that's, you know, my background is, uh, as I've mentioned a few times, it's not in engineering, it's not in computer science. 
My undergrad degree was in international studies with a focus on Latin American politics. And I have a bachelor, a master's degree in economics. Uh, so by all, um, by all measures, I really shouldn't be in this job. I shouldn't be in this role. Um, so I absolutely get imposter syndrome. But the way that I manage that uh, is that I remember that, you know, my the last time I was in school was almost 10 years ago. Uh, and I've done I spent a couple I spent a total of, you know, six years between bachelor's degree and master's degree in school. I've spent over 10 years in my career. Uh, and almost all of that is relevant to the work that I'm doing and has led to the job that I have now. And so I kind of try to think of it as, you know, sure, I didn't have the exact start that most people would expect for this business, but everything that I've done up to now uh, has led me into the seat that I have and hopefully made me uh, effective in the job that I'm trying to do. Yeah, it gives you that more diverse background and you could probably think a little bit more outside the box. I mean, you did mention a few things in the presentation and it had me thinking like, uh, if we just watch the first five seasons of Game of Thrones, that will help us on our career path. Also, <laughs> some of the things that you're mentioning, it's like, yes. be... <laughs> yeah, especially absolutely. one of the be... things that we say all the time in my job, you know, in conversations with my boss now about negotiating a particular conflict at the company uh, over how we do something is he reminds me all the time, this is chess. This is not checkers. Uh, you know, don't just think about the move that we're about to make. Think about how it affects everything else and the strategy that we have and think three or four moves ahead. Uh, that'll be a big help to you as you try to navigate those situations. Well, there was something huge that you said, and it's like, don't pick a side. You're, you're, if you're the data engineer, you do what you got to do and you don't want to make it harder for you the next time you need the business side to be on your team or the other side to be on like the technical side to be on your team. So I found that one fascinating because I have a very hard time just biting my tongue, but it is very wise when you do it like that. Yeah. And I, I will say that is a lesson that I, I learned <clears throat> through experience. Um, when I first started in this, I had a tendency to try to go all in and ingratiate myself with one side of the business or another there. Uh, and, and that came back to bite me a few times. And I had to go back and, and rebuild some of the trust that I had lost mm -hmm. with other folks and other colleagues. And uh, so not a lesson that I've learned in the abstract, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> you have the scars to prove it. That's, that's sure. very awesome. And, you know, I've found myself before going through organizations and obviously at a startup, you feel it less because there's less people. But when you do need buy-in for something and it is outside of your sphere of influence or your team, and then you need to go figure out who is the person that will control this or ultimately say yes to this, and you have a bit of that detective game, uh, what, I, besides like studying the org chart, uh, what do you recommend there? Because I find it's not until I like go down that path once that I know, oh, okay, here's the path and that's how I do it. So if I need to do it again, then I can do it. But do you have ways to like circumvent that so that if I do need to go down that path, I can already know? Um, really, like, like you said, the best way is to have already done it once. Um, but some things that you might be able to do, some clues that you can look for, if you will, to, to maybe figure it out a little bit quicker um, is just pay attention to your company's uh, Slack or whatever chat that you do. Pay attention to the email threads that are going out. Um, mm -hmm. When there are important announcements about the topic that you're interested in, who's sending that email? Who's sending that Slack message? Who's okay. speaking on the company all hands? That'll help you out. Um, that can be a clue as well. Um, and looking for small things. You know, In many cases, the people who are looked to to make decisions about small things are often the people who are making decisions about big things. Uh, so if you're in a meeting and somebody comes up with a task that needs to be done and they say, you know, hey, look over there uh, at Jim and Jim will tell you who's going to be the engineer responsible for that. That's a pretty good clue that Jim might be the person who's responsible for bigger things at that team as well. Um, so there's patterns that you can pick up on. But as you mentioned, the only surefire way is, is to see it play out once and, and make a note of it. Oh man, so good. And yes, I hadn't even thought of that, but just, yeah, who's sending out those email updates uh, about, or talking at the all hands. Great, great points. Okay, man, 
I got to kick you off as much as I would love to keep you on here. We're going to keep cruising and there are amazing questions and chats coming through. So if you have a minute, jump on there. Otherwise, everyone can reach out to you on LinkedIn.